Okay, so, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Christy Erickson and I am the Electronic Resources and Languages Librarian at the University of Alaska Anchorage Consortium Library. Um, and I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Bjartmar's daughter and I'm the Instruction and Research Librarian at uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage Consortium Library. And um, I work with the writing and the English department and do collection development for them as well as other areas. Thanks. Yeah, so um, just Anna and I both do collection development and so that we purchase materials for the, the library's collection in our various um, areas, so literature and languages. Um, and we also, as Anna mentioned, we also do uh, library instruction for students um, and classes, as well as research consultations uh, for students who um, need help um, with their projects. Um, so just a little background about what we do. Um, so just a little uh, Zoom uh, webinar logistics. Uh, we will be um, saving about 15 minutes at the end of the session for questions. So if you have any questions, just feel free to enter those into the Q&A, um, the link down at the bottom of your screen um, throughout the session, and then we'll, um, we'll address those towards the end of the session. So, um, so I think we'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. We're so excited they're here. Um, they, they have some really interesting backgrounds. And so uh, Anna, do you wanna start? Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, I'm very excited to, to um, introduce uh, Jenna Tang. She is a Taiwanese writer and a literary translator from Chinese and Spanish. She graduated with an MFA in fiction creative writing from the New School in New York City. Uh, her translations are published in Restless Books, International Anthology, and We Came Outside and Saw the Stars Again, Latin American Literature Today, AAWW, McSweeney's, Catapult and elsewhere. Uh, her interviews can be found in World Literature Today and Words Without Borders. She's currently based in Long Island City, New York uh, and working on her novel, The Sirens. She was also selected as one of the eight emerging translators for the 2021 Alta Emerging Translators Mentorship Program. She is mentored by Mike Fu, translator of San Mao's Stories of the Sahara. Welcome, Jenna. We're so glad you're here. Um, and I'd like to introduce Kathleen Maris uh, Paltrinari. Uh, she's a poet and a literary translator from Iowa, and she's the recipient of the 2021-22 Fulbright Fellowship to edit and translate an anthology of contemporary Norwegian eco-poetry. She holds an MFA in literary translation from the University of Iowa and an MFA in creative writing from the University of New Hampshire. Her poems are forthcoming from Bennington Review and her translations of Kristen Berga's poetry collection and When the Light Comes, It Will Be Fantastic are forthcoming from Brink Literary Journal. Her interviews with translators and authors have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Exchanges, Journal of Literary Translation and Origins, the International Writing Program podcast, which she created and edited while she was the fall residency coordinator at the IWP. So welcome to both of you. And I just wanted to add that um, I know both of these panelists. Um, uh, last year, I took my uh, first my first uh, translation workshop through Catapult um, and Jenna was in the class and I just, um, she was a fantastic uh, workshop mate and um, gave me lots of really good um, uh, advice um, on my translation. So, and then Kathleen, I actually met in Norway at, uh, while we were studying Norwegian at the University of Oslo, uh, the International Summer School, which is a six week summer program. And so, um, and we got to visit the Norwegian Literature Abroad offices. Uh, we were both interested in translation. And that also led to us um, going to the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2019, where Norway was the country guest of honor. And so we got to meet lots of uh, authors and translators and um, just it was really um, an interesting time. So I'm so glad that I've been able to follow both of you and you're doing some incredible things. Um, so just to, um, a little bit of background about how we started this uh, panel or the, our, the idea behind the panel. Um, so Anna and I um, love talking about literature and languages and translation. We both dabbled a little bit in translation and we are interested in pursuing it more. 
Um, and so as we spoke more, we thought, well, maybe other people would be interested in this topic as well. Um, so in, um, and then also we wanted to highlight some of the library's collections uh, and um, mainly literature and translation that the library has and mainly um, that literature published since 2000. So we collaborated together on a contemporary global literature library guide, which we planned on turning into um, a series of events. Um, so, and this is actually our first event. Um, so we um, learned that August is Women in Translation Month. Um, and we thought it would be a perfect way for us to, to kind of kick off our, um, our series and um, talk about something that we're, we're both really interested in. Um, and so a little bit of background about Women in Translation Month. Um, so in 2007, the University of Rochester started um, um, a project called 3% um, in collaboration with um, Open Letter Press, which is the university's translation press. And they founded, uh, um, they established a translation database um, in 2008 to track all publications of fiction and poetry uh, published in the US uh, in English translation. Um, and to get a sense of what, what's being published and what new voices are being made available in English. So, um, and through that uh, translation database, it was discovered that um, only about 3% of uh, works published in the US um, are translations into English. So that's a very small number. Um, and so unless, unfortunately, we can't all learn every language that there is out there. Some of us know multiple languages as it is, and it's great to be able to read literature in the original languages, but that leaves out so much of the world's literature. Um, so um, the, this um, project is to help raise awareness of, of literature in translation um, and open um, other authors and um, literature um, to English speakers, basically. Then in 2014, um, a woman named Metal Radzinski, who is a research biologist in Israel, um, was also interested, she would read a lot of um, literature in translation. Um, she's uh, bilingual in English and Hebrew. Um, she's currently studying for her PhD at the University of Jerusalem. And she began to research and write more about women writers in translation and began a blog um, where she was reviewing those books. Um, and then in 2014, she began an initiative um, uh, called Women in Translation Month. Um, so, and again, of those, of the 3% of literature that it gets translated into English, only about 30% of those um, she um, found were by women writers. So 3%, 30% of three, you know, that's, that's not a whole lot. And also of those, um, about 30% of books that are translated into English, um, only about 36% of those books are from non-European countries. So most of what's being published in translation is from you know the the major language major European languages. So that leaves out um, a lot of other literature. So um, so she had the goal of helping to promote women writers from around the world um, writing in languages other than English. We're we're kind of focusing on translation into English for this audience um, for the U.S. Um, but it d doesn't necessarily have to be published or translated into English. So, um, and the project also promotes works by underrepresented um, trans and non-binary writers as well. So um, basically any un underrepresented groups um, for this. And then in August of this year, August 1st, um, she expanded her blog into a website, uh, womenintranslation.org. And that's in the, um, in our resources list. Um, and that has lots of great resources and statistics as well as annual lists of um, works that have been published by women um, in translation, um, which is a really great resource. So if you want to add to your reading list, definitely go and check that out. So, um, so now I'm gonna let Anna talk a little bit more <laughs> so, um, about uh, translation in general. Yeah, so um, I wanted to take this time to kind of give a general explanation or definition of what translation and translation theory or translation studies is, um, just to give you some context in terms of what we're going to be talking about with the panelists later. Um, 
So literary translation is the translation of dramatic and creative poetry and prose into other languages. Um, this would include things like poetry, plays, literary books, uh, songs, rhymes, literary articles, novels, short stories, etc., from the source or the original language to the target audience. So um, a translator needs to have a thorough knowledge of the source language um, and um, an understanding of the culture. So that means both the source and the target language, translation techniques, and the ability to write in the target language. There are some challenges involved in translation, and uh, that includes things like retaining the style or tone of the original work. Um, the translator needs to be able to create a balance between remaining true to the original work while creating an entirely unique work that captures the feeling and emotion and the meaning of the original work. It's a very tricky balance. Um, there may be no direct translation for certain words or passages um, or no obvious ones, or there may be several options with subtle differences in meaning. And a translator needs to be able to make those kinds of choices and understand those distinctions um, to be successful. Um, there's also uh, an issue of the cultural differences. Um, when you translate without considering cultural differences, it can result in uncomfortable or even offensive situations. So it's really critical to understand the nuances and the subtleties of the language. So at this point, with that said, um, I wanted to turn uh, our attention to the panelists and get started with asking them some questions. Um, so for both of you, um, I'd like to ask how you became interested in uh, translation and on uh, uh, in addition, why did you become a translator and what path did you take to get to this point? Um, such as, and you can talk about your first translation experiences as well, if you wish. Um, so, um, uh, Jenna, maybe you can start. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, the very my very first experience getting into translation, I guess, it comes from how I'm always um, my college major was French, and later on, I picked up. Spanish as well, and I've always been a student for languages. And so I guess back in Taiwan, um, many, many students who are studying languages are expect to, expected to become an interpreter or a translator. And so that's inherently what we we're being taught to become after we graduate from college. And so I, I did have in mind that I would like to come to the US for an MFA program in creative writing. And so translation was my, my major and primary way to save money to come to the US. And so that was what brought me first into translation. And also while I was doing my MFA program um, in New York at the new school, I guess when I was navigating how I let my characters talk in my novel, I kept thinking about how these characters are actually based in Taiwan and they're all Taiwanese and how do I inform their tone and their dialogues and their cultures into English that still like in a way that still keeps the culture inside and not somehow it just involves some kind of translation. So with that question in mind, I started to dig into translations that are being literature that are being translated into English. And that's how I went, how I came so far and the professor started to talk to me about um, how we can get involved in ALTA, which is the American Literary Translators, Translators Association, and just getting involved in ALTA, getting to know other translators and the resources we can get, and of course, taking my very first translation workshop with, with Christy, with Bruna Don Hustobado, that really informed me a lot just how the world of literary translation looks like in America. And, and for those of you who are attending, um, we have uh, links um, to some of these organizations, including Alta. So you'll be able to follow up and, and see what they're all about. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's so interesting to me to hear the different uh, vantage points of you know, how people get involved in this. Um, Kathleen, uh, would you like to share your, um, your start in translation? Yeah. Um... Thank you both so much for, for inviting me to be on this panel. I love, I love talking about all things translation and I'm excited to be here with Jenna. 
Um, yeah, so I, I would say I really first came to translation through my own experience being a reader and a writer. Um, I discovered that so many of the books that I was falling in love with were works of literary translation were coming to me via trans translators <laughs> um hard work um so you know collections like inger christensen's alphabet translated from the Dan danish by susanna need or uh if not winter fragments of sappho translated by ann carson um and so i just yeah from a very very uh, sort of early stage of my own pathway in becoming a writer, I was thinking a great deal about translation. Um, and so I, I did do an MFA in creative writing at the University of New Hampshire. Um, and uh, Charles Simic was teaching there at the time, and he himself is also a translator. And another professor, David Rivard, offered a, a seminar um, in uh, essentially teaching works of translation and and talking about how they were, you know, kind of appearing in English. Um, and yeah, so so from early on, I I was interested in in translation. Um, and then afterward, I worked at the International Writing Program as a full residency coordinator. Um, and it's a program that invites writers from all over the world every year, something like 30 writers um, from, you know, from every continent came to Iowa City and they're here for three months and they um, you know, they they work they work on their own pieces of literature, but then they also give um, lectures and readings, and uh, also connect with translators in in the translation program at, at Iowa. Um, and so, in my job there, I was in a in a position to really help facilitate these kinds of you know cross cultural exchanges, and um, and it really it really helped me to kind of like on an annual basis with a new mix of writers, we conceive of what literature can be um, and how, you know, how different conceptions or approaches to literature or poetry, for example, can come about. Um, and so that that sort of led me to, to wanting to really get into translation myself. Um, I started studying Norwegian when I, I think I was like in junior high um, and there are, a bunch of camps, they're immersive language camps in Minnesota, and they're called the Concordia Language Villages. And you can, as a high school student, get credit, language credit for studying Arabic or Chinese or Japanese or Korean or all of the Scandinavian languages <laughs> um, or various other um, languages. And so my sister and I went there um, in part because my my grandmother, who has uh, Norwegian heritage, was really of the generation where her parents were not teaching her the language. Um, so it was sort of present in terms of I don't know, folk tales or food or different cultural um, aspects, but she she really wanted us to learn, learn the language. Um, and so I began studying there and then later studied at the University of Oslo. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some of the different different ways and, and pathways into into translation um, that I've had and, and also to language. Those camps sound really wonderful. What an opportunity for a young person to get to do that. Um, yeah, that's, that's really something I hope that uh, my daughter can participate in as well. It sounds great. Um, Christy. I think. Yeah, so just wanted to mention the Concordia camps. Um, they have them for children, but they also have some camps for adults as well. So I don't know if it's for every language, but um, I just added the, the link uh, to that. Uh, the language camps. So yeah, it might be fun to do it as an adult as well. <laughs> so I've heard such good things about them. So um, so thank you both um, for talking more about how you, you got into translation. Um, Jenna, I, um, you were selected as one of the eight emerging translators uh, for the 2021 Alta Emerging Translators Mentorship Program. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about that program and um, how, how you got into that and your experiences with that so far? Yeah, of course. Um, usually Alta would start calling for submissions um, for applications for those who would like to participate in a mentorship program. And they would start around November each year for the application. And then they usually announce around um, somewhere in January or February um, who gets selected eventually. 
um, I was preparing for this application for a while because I figured out that after I took my very first translation workshop with Bruna and, and you, of course, um, I was feeling very driven to actually translate a whole book on my own. And so after I after I shared my very first draft of translation um, of Feng Siqing's first novel, Paradise, it's a Taiwanese novel that I've been currently translating. After the workshop, I just felt like I want to translate this whole book. This is about it's about female's body, it's about sexual assault, and it's about a lot of things that's that's left unspoken in a country in the language that is that is also comparably underrepresented. So feeling that, I feel like. Um, in the process of translation um, linguistically and also the process of getting published um, itself. Like I just have so many questions that I feel like as much as I've been trying to connect with other translators, I still feel like I just have these questions coming up in different stage of working on this book length translation. So eventually I came, um, I was just looking for resources um, and I figured that having a mentorship, if I, get the opportunity. It would help me a lot in the process of knowing how to edit my own translation and knowing um, knowing that I actually don't need to translate word by word as much as we do want to stick to the original meaning of the story. But we also want, want to consider um, how it looks like when the story is being translated into English and that English may, might have a different way of interpreting, not interpreting, but a different way of presenting the story. And so all of these questions get answered as I'm doing my mentorship with Mike Fu. Um, we, we share a lot of commonalities. He also speaks French, Spanish, and sometimes we just chat about learning languages overall and traveling. And what I find most helpful and most um, worthy is that it feels like coming across the bridge. Like sometimes I, I, was, um, I grew up in Taiwan, and so there are many cultural nuances that I would get it right away. And Mike grew up in America. And so he, on the other side, like he offers me so much cultural nuances about English speaking audiences perspective. And so just coming from both sides really helped me understand um, what needs to be done to make the translation even better and even more, even easier to be understood. And so that was the main takeaway for me in my mentorship and also just getting, getting to know like how to put together a pitch letter and how to pitch a book length translation or a shorter excerpt or perhaps conversations about um, different themes about translation overall, like women in translation, queer translation, querying translation. And there are so many things to talk about that really just in a in the process of nine months working on the same manuscript and also just like shorter translations that I've been working on overall, it really helps me think about translation in a different way. And knowing that you have this one person who's knowledgeable, um, at least more knowledgeable than you to talk about all these processes and know that you're not alone really helps me grow into a better translator. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Taking lots of notes too. <laughs> so. Um, so Kathleen, um, on a similar note, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your Fulbright study, a research, research grant in translation to Norway um, for 2021-22? Yeah, definitely. I'd be happy to. Also, Jenna, that sounds like such a wonderful mentorship um, opportunity. It's so great that Alta offers those. Um, yeah, so I, um, my, my Fulbright, um, which is the start of which is currently a little bit delayed because of the, the pandemic, um, but my, my project is to edit and translate a collection of contemporary Norwegian eco poetry or eco poetry from Norway, I should say. Um, and one of the ways in which I came to this project was through the translation of Kristen Bergett's um, poetry, fifth poetry collection. And when the light comes, it will be fantastic. It's certainly a work that is, 
you know, it grass together themes of like nature, language, motherhood, loss, um, mm. and through this this translation and and my research in terms of understanding where this particular book and her work in general um, fits into a a larger uh, Norwegian context and Scandinavian literary context and Nordic literary context, um, I began to see you know how um, and and to discover and, and read about how long of a tradition environmental um, art and, and literature has has been important to the country specifically of, of Norway. Um, and so I'm really interested in bringing a, a cross, um, you know, a, a cross section of of translation from from contemporary um, writers. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really fascinating and that often people don't necessarily know is that Norway is not a monolingual um, country. Um, so there are two no written Norwegian scripts, um, several Norwegian uh, dialects, and then also um, the Sami indigenous language group as well. Um, there are multiple languages there. So I'm specifically interested in collaborating or co-editing or hiring translators um, from that linguistic diversity that exists within Norway. Um, and I'm really excited to, to celebrate that um, and bring some, hopefully some awareness. Um, and some of the questions I'm interested in, uh, you know, some of my research questions or questions I'm interested in exploring through this process is, you know, how eco poetry can raise um, awareness about material consequences <laughs> of human behavior um, on the environment and um, and also, you know, what are some of the relationships between nature and culture, language and perception. Um, yeah, so so I'm very excited um, and and hope that I can arrive there soon. But um, yeah, I'm still continuing my my research and and translation in preparation for for going um, to Norway. And I'll be hosted by the University of Oslo uh, for half the time, and then also the University of Tromsø up in the Arctic Circle for the other half of the time, so I can have geographic access to <laughs> writers <laughs> since the country is is very. Um, very long and narrow <laughs> and mountainous. <laughs> oh, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. And there's so many cross sections, uh, you know, involved in what you're doing. So very interesting. Um, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> thank you. Definitely, definitely interested in following along and, and hearing more about that project. So, um, so uh, this next question is for um, both of you. Um, so one question I get asked a lot or I hear a lot is how fluent do you need to be um, to how fluent do you need to be to be a good translator? Um, so and there's also, you know, different keeping in mind differences between um, interpreting and translating, which I, I think a lot of people don't quite understand the difference between those two, the, the spoken versus the written. Um, so, and, and how does one as a translator keep up their, their language skills? Um, uh, so do you have any thoughts on, on language and um, fluency? Um, um, yes, I can speak to that. Um, I do think a certain level of fluency is required. At least we need to be able to read in this language and understand the story. Um, contained within and also just the themes and ties from the story. And I think those are very important. And it's, at the same time, it's also about our cultural experience with, the, with this target, targeted language, um, original language and targeted languages um, environment overall. And at the same time, I think there's also one thing to think about is that, do we understand the culture? Are we interested in it? And um, Christy just spoke about the difference between interpretation and literary translation. Interpretation requires so much of immediacy. Like when someone says one sentence, you have to think about um, think about the translation right away and just say it in the target, targeted language. And literary translation has a lot more molding over. Um, it's like when it's like reading a different reading different literature from a writer's perspective. No matter where we come from, we're all readers, writers, and we're trying to interpret those stories in a very literary way and in our way as well. And so just literary translation has this 
aspect where we look over the text and think about what this this word or this section might entice and what does that section and the themes um, echo to another culture. So there's a lot of thinking over and also just thinking about if there's a um, double meaning to certain words and what does this word mean culturally in the original language and how should I bring it to a newer audience in a targeted language. So I think there's a lot of questions like that. And definitely we need the influence, uh, we need the fluency to be able to read and perhaps to write and to be able to understand like the literary style from, from both languages. Um, but at the same time, there's so much nuances we need to understand as well. And also questions um, that we need to consider. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with a lot of, of what um, Jenna just said in terms of, you know, different ways to, to consider how to, um, you know, connect with the literary culture and, and the, the language that you're translating from. Um, I personally haven't done any live interpretation, so, so I don't have any experience with that, but um, I, think it's, I think it's fascinating and I really admire people who, who are able in, in, you know, a split second to, to translate live. Um, perhaps one day I can aspire to that. I think that's, that's really fantastic. Um, so, so in terms of language proficiency, I would I would agree. I think it's really important to have an advanced language proficiency to be able to, you know, um, read read well and read quickly the the language that you're translating from. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways to to keep up with language. Um, language is certainly something that is constantly evolving, um, and so, you know. Uh, you know, in a in a context of of Norway, for example, if you're re looking at poetry that was written in 1950 versus 2020, I mean, you can find enormous differences in in vocabulary that's being used, or um, yeah, even even sort of uh, structures that are that are being used, the kind of slang that gets used. So, so I do think it's very important to um not only develop a, a language proficiency but also to to maintain and, and keep up um with with a language and there are a lot of different ways to do that um outside of formal language classes you know developing or working with um you know, uh, conversational partners, or or you know, developing um, community with with writers and translators, writers in the country um, or from the languages that you're translating from, but and also translators um, that you know share same the same languages. Um, and then, yeah, some of the ways that that mention Jenna was mentioning as well. You know, having a sense for broader cultural understanding, reading. You know, reading the literature, um, reading literary criticism, reading the daily news, um, getting a sense for popular culture um, in addition to literary culture, I think can be really interesting and, and important. So not only being conversant in the language, but also the literary culture is, is really um, important, kind of understanding how authors are situated in various literary lineages um, and, you know, if there are any sort of specific uh, language characteristics or or styles in which they are are writing in uh, can be important. Getting a sense for allusions or the kinds of texts or cultural references an author can can work with um, are are always fun to to explore and, and to research. Um, and so yeah, all of this takes a lot of research and, and time to develop, but but I do think it's it's a lot of fun for um, and 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 important to keep up on. Thank you both. Our favorite thing, research. <laughs> it sounds like, uh, yeah, you really have to immerse yourself, um, which, you know, we as librarians really love to do. So <laughs> um, I'd like to ask both of you guys um, if you, I, I know you both have MFA degrees in creative writing. Um, Jenna has an MFA in fiction creative writing and Kathleen has an MFA in literary translation and an MFA in creative writing. Um, I'd like to ask, um, has this degree helped you in your translation? Um, you're both writers, um, and uh, I want to know if you would recommend uh, 
people that are interested in translation, uh, if you would recommend them getting an MFA or pursuing an MFA. Yeah, so I think the biggest takeaway for me from my MFA program is that I get to read so extensively and um, there's certain level of cultural Im immersion. Um, it's not just cultural immersion, it's also just literary immersion. Like I dedicate two years um, just reading extensively from various authors in America and, and also from all around the world. And at the same time, um, just I remember there's one translator telling all the other translators that the best translation um, it's so good that people wouldn't notice that it's from an international author being translated into English. And I think that was really fascinating. And I remember reading several novels back in one of my literary seminars in MFA program and that I didn't notice that they were being translated. Um, and, and to this day, just thinking about that, um, I kind of just set it as my goal um, as a literary translator that I do want to delve deep enough into the cultural understanding and translating the book to be able to reach this level. And at the same time, I think the literary skills and strategies we need um, when reading literature is definitely needed for, for becoming a better translator because we know like um, how POV and how different craft craft elements are being used in different cultures. And that's something that's also interesting to talk about with other translators and with other authors. And, and it also affects um, my reading experience um, of how much I love delving into the high, highly cultural kind of narratives. And that's how I was being brought into translation. I would definitely recommend doing MFA program, um, but at the same time, there's many things to consider. Like some people wonder if it's worth the time spending two years or less or more into an MFA program for creative writing. I think it is if you meet the immersion. And most of all, an MFA program provides you with a community. And from my experience, I spent, I was in New York City. So I spent a lot of time um, doing internship with different indie publishers. And I was um, meeting up with a lot of different agents and listening to how they share about um, their journey working with an author or working with a new emerging author. So there's a lot of exposure to how the publishing works, how literary, um, not just literary translation, but also just how literary world works in America. And there's so much conversation with the authors about how to write a better novel and what you need to consider in terms of craft elements and in terms of the themes you would like to entice and things you would like to get more spoken out with um, in your own story or the works that you're working on. And so the immersion at itself is really important for me to grow as a writer because I, I learned to build a consistency and I learned to build a routine for myself as a writer and later as a translator. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, I think that if people have an opportunity to, um, you know, take two, two years out of <laughs> um, whatever else they may have going on in their life to, to get an MFA, I think um, it can be a really wonderful and, and supportive environment. Um, I've had really positive experiences. Um, you know, as I as I mentioned before, I really came to translation through my experience as as being a poet, and so um, both of the programs. You know, it, it of course is not necessary <laughs> to have two MFA, two MFAs or even one, but um, to be a writer or a translator. But but I do think, as Jenna was saying, it it can provide so many opportunities for community. Um, it gives you an opportunity to to really explore writing um, and 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 play and research and trying things out and reading new works, um, reading extensively, I think is so important. Um, also studying your language or classes from taking courses on your the literary culture that that you're writing from um, or translating from. Um, uh, you know, I can talk a little bit about the University of Iowa, uh, the MFA there. Um, 
it's it's a part of the writing university and so it's it's in, it's kind of set in this constellation of various different mfa programs including the workshop um, there's a Spanish language creative writing MFA, which I think is really uh, fantastic, nonfiction, playwriting, various other um, uh, MFA programs. And so, you know, in addition to the, the translation program, you're also in a community of, of writers at large. Um, and um, you have an opportunity to, um, to study with translators in, in residence. Um, so often the university will invite, uh, usually there's one each semester. Um, and so some of the recent re translators and residents have been Alana Marie Levison, Labros, uh, Jennifer Croft, Annie Janusz, Katrina Dodson, Deborah Smith. Um, so, so translators from, from many different languages and, and the faculty at Iowa really try to invite people um, who specifically offer languages that, for example, the core faculty don't have or, um, um, yeah, or, or, you know, uh, translators that are focusing in areas that, that connect with the, the current student body. Um, and then there are also uh, editorial opportunities at an MFA. So, for example, um, at, at Iowa, you have Exchanges, a Journal of Literary Translation. Um, there's also a new um, journal called Ancient Exchanges, and they focus on translation from ancient texts, which is really exciting. And there's also a brand new podcast called Translators Note Exchanges Audio. Um, and so it's, you know, podcast conversations with translators about about their work. Um, so I think taking advantage of editorial opportunities while you're at an MFA is it's really wonderful um, real life experience and and also fantastic for developing yourself as as a writer seeing what comes in and what kinds of translation people are really you know interested in and what's happening right now in the literary community um and in terms of the academic program itself students take translation workshops um they take theory courses um courses in source language literature um, and also the, the university is, they currently have a, a minor for undergraduates and in the next academic year starting in 2022, they'll have a major for undergraduate students in literary translation, which is, which is really exciting. Um, of course, I know not everyone has the opportunity to, to take two years away and there are also low residency programs. Um, there's a new one in Vermont and also I believe Drew University and there are other, um, translation MFAs across the country. But but if um, if people have the opportunity to do it, I, I very much recommend it. And I also think, um, you know, searching for programs that are are funded is is really important as well. Um, yeah. Sounds like a lot of wonderful resources and connections that you can make as well through through those programs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you so much. So, so many interesting things. Um, so we are rapidly running out of time. Unfortunately, we have quite a few more questions that we wanted to get to, um, but we wanted to leave some time um, since this is Women in Translation Month um, for Jenna and Kathleen to recommend some of their favorite um, works, um, which have also been added to the um, the uh, Google Doc uh, whoops, of resources that we were sharing. So I'll share that again. Um, so Jenna or um, Kathleen, do you want to go ahead? And we don't have a whole lot of time. Maybe you won't, might not be able to get through all of the recommendations, but um, what, what are your favorite works um, that you'd like to recommend or, or tell people about? Um, I do have the books with me um, right now. Um, this is Cursed Bunny. Um, it's from South Korean author Boracho. And it was translated by Anton Her, who was an amazing translator that I got to know. Um, this is a short story collection where it talks about, there's a lot of horror inside. And it talks a lot about women's body and there's menstruation included. And also there's so many aspects of a woman's body and fairy tale like elements inside the story. Like each story is different from one another. It's not, um, it's not always connected to each other, um, but I, I really love how one of the translators I know, like she phrased it this way. She said, this book is giving me so many weird dreams. <laughs> um, and that is how I love it. Um, 
I find the unsettling narratives, especially the international unsettling narratives, speaks a lot about queer translation and also about women in translation. There's so much in horror that's being rendered because, because of the surreal elements being used inside the literature that enables all of these voices to be spoken out. And the other, if there's anyone who's into poetry, I would recommend um, Cat Calling, translated by So Jae, also a South Korean author. Um, this is also talking about uh, women's position in a society and how like sexual harassment and and how like what is women's role in a domestic in the domesticity. And there's a lot of narrative kind of poetry contained in this collection that I find really fascinating because it doesn't always read like poetry or like a still state of mind. It feels like a story being read in a poetic way. And I included more um, in my recommendations and just um, keeping in mind with the time, I'll let, I'll pass this to Kathleen first. <laughs> So I have to apologize. I'm sorry. I blame it on the pandemic brain. I was thinking we only had it. We were done at 1.30, but we have until two. So I apologize profusely to everyone. So we actually have time um, to talk. We don't have to hurry through these. Um, so sorry about that. So um, I'm excited to read read both of those books that Jenna shared. And so, um, yeah, this is a collection that I mentioned earlier. It's a little hard to see the text on the cover, I realize. Um, it's Ingrid Christensen's Alphabet, which is translated by Suzanne Anid. And it was published uh, really quite a lot of, uh, a while ago, but um, it's, it, it's structured in, it's it's based on the, the structure is based on the Fibonacci sequence, um, which I think is really fascinating. And so um, the language really, really builds according to, according to that, um, and as well as, as the alphabet. So yeah, I've just been really interested in how, how sort of structural um, the book is. It's a collection of poetry and um, and thematically it's it's definitely exploring um, you know uh, consequences of of nuclear bombing, nuclear text testing um, and um, you know impacts of course not only on human life but also non-human life. Um, so what are some of the greater ecological considerations? Um, and it's a it's a really I think seminal book um, in terms of of Nordic poetry. Um, and then the other one maybe I'll talk about it's actually a, a book of literary translation studies. Um, and so it's called Literary Translations and the Makings of Originals by Karen Emmerich, who translates from Greek. Um, and it's it's a really fascinating book talking about about many many things but really looking at you know uh sort of situating situ situating translation in 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 the world of um particularly poetry um and looking at poets like emily dickinson and considering how many different iterations and versions and variations of her poetry exist um and 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 what we can you know consider or, or think about in relationship to translation. So thinking in terms of the broader translation um, sphere and, you know, looking at an author like, you know, Henrik, Henrik Ibsen, for example, I mean, there are many, many translations um, and, and very new translations, recent translations, uh, retranslation. And so thinking in terms of edition and, and um, iteration and, and how that can kind of, um, I guess frame a, a reconsideration of what is an original text and and what is a translation and um, you know thinking about about some of those concerns and then I also um, offered a few other recommendations that I can and I can add a few more too. Thank you for sharing those. It makes me um, really want to get started reading. We, <laughs> we do have more time if you want to yeah. go through so. Um, if either of you want to go through the other um, selections that you have, we definitely have time. So I'm very embarrassed that I can't tell time. So I'm sorry about that. So go ahead. If, if you want to go through the rest of your recommendations, feel free. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the other three books I recommend for the audience. One is um, The Danger of Smoking in Bed by Mariana Enriquez. It was translated by Megan McDowell. And this is also a, sto a short story collection, which also talks about horror. And um, I previously expressed how much I love um, horror and unsettling narratives from different cultural perspectives. And this is one of, one of them. And Mariana discusses a lot. Um, she incorporates a lot about the Argentine dictatorship back, um, back in the history and how, those, how the dictatorship and the brutality itself affects um, the everyday life of different families and, and children and also just about like the state of mind of different characters um, throughout the collection. It's, it's one of those books that I, I couldn't help reading. Um, I couldn't help but keep reading. I just cannot stop. And at the same time, it's just so terrifying that it's so powerful that I still remember every single detail and trying not to have spoilers here. So, so I'll just keep the titles um, for everyone. The other one I read is To the Warm Horizon by Che Jin Yong. Um, it's also translated by So Jay. It's one of these books that I do have a playlist um, when I read this book. And there's also a lot about sexual violence against women. And this is an apocalyptic novel um, imagined, but also reflected our reality. There's so much about the ten, there's so much tenderness and violence inside that the tenderness somehow swallowed the violence um, being mentioned in this book. And that I have this when I read, there's this kind of like bittersweet kind of feeling that I felt, but also it's tender. And so it's like another way for me, I don't know how to describe this feeling, but it's like so much tenderness that, that embraces the sexual violence in a very thoughtful way that just keeps me thinking about the topic itself. And the last one I would, I would recommend is Shiori Ito. Um, her new book, Black Box, just came out in July from Feminist Press. And it's her personal memoir about her own experience with sexual violence as well. Um, there's so much about the statistics. And um, it's such a brave narrative that she just um, recounted her own experiences, which is heartbreaking. And there's so much about how the Japanese society view victims of sexual violence. <laughs> And everything's inside and everything's written in the first person perspective, which is really moving. And it's also one of the one of the books that feel like it's a very powerful emotional narrative that I just couldn't stop reading. And that's all my recommendations for now. Thank you for sharing those. I see my list getting longer and longer here. <laughs> I can share a couple of others that I see I'm gonna just be like adding more to my list, but um, <laughs> one of them is um, a collection of poetry called Killing Plato by Chantal Maillard and it's translated by Yvette Siegert. And I have a copy of it, but um, I'm not entirely sure where it is at the moment, but it's, it's published by New Directions um, and it essentially has these two like braided sequences, um, one of which is, um, situated around an, an accident, a car accident that happens. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, there's another um, sequence that is really, um, you know, kind of um, unfolding a, a, you know, a, a relationship between a, a man and a woman and, and the sort of philosophic conversation um, around, around poetry and, and around literature. Um, and yeah, so I think I'm just, it's, it's something that I, one of the things I really love about it is just sort of how it ranges from narrative to literal, literal uh, lyrical, excuse me, and then also philosophical to, to poetic. And I think it's a really wonderful um, collection. Um, and then perhaps another book I would read is a short novel um, called Love by Hannah Ostevik, and it's translated by Martin Aiken, I believe. Um, Aiken, and uh, it's a really 
it's a really wonderful novel where, um, you know, there's sort of a, the two main characters are, are a mother and son. Um, and um, the, the point of view just keeps switching. Um, and, and at first it's a little disorienting when you're, when you're reading it because you're not entirely sure who's, whose voice um, you're, you're seeing the, the scene through or, or understanding the, the situation through. Um, and it becomes the switches in, in, in perspective um, uh, more, more frequent and, um, and less explicit. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, it's an interesting, very interesting work in, in terms of, you know, thinking about, about perspective um, and, and relationship. And then there are, there are others that I can recommend as well. I'll, I'll send to the Google, Google Doc. And this will be available to all the viewers, um, the attendees that are here today. So um, you can you can uh, take a look at all of those titles um, in the document that's in the chat. So we actually have time to ask some of the other questions that we had. <laughs> so I just like to mix things up a bit, right? Um, so Anna, do you want to? Should we go back and ask some of those other questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe we can pick it up uh, since, um, you know, we want to make sure we leave time for questions at the end um, or somewhere around uh, the representation and translation. Um, and, and this is all, you know, many of the questions that we're asking, they're kind of, you know, going to overlap a bit because, you know, this, they're sort of open-ended. <laughs> um, so, you know, having to do with culture and language and so on. So, um, but in any case, uh, if you want to pick up there, maybe that would be a good spot. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So the whole purpose behind Women in Translation Month is um, this recognition that only 30% of works translated into English are written by women. Why is it important to have more representation of women? Um, and we could talk about um, some of the, the things that we mentioned before. Um, for example, whose voices are being heard and um, who who gets published, you know, it, it's in um, and, and what languages get published. So there's a lot of um, a lot of the languages, I believe, again, about 36 percent of the languages that are um, published are kind of the, the dominant languages uh, the European languages, as opposed to some of the minority or underrepresented languages. So what are your, what do you, why is Women in Translation Month important? What are your thoughts on that? Or is it important? I mean, I think we all believe it's important, but <laughs> what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that I, I'm really excited that um, this, you know, this project has has been created, um, and I, I do think it's very important to to bring attention to uh, not only women authors but also women translators, um, and and thinking about the world of literature and and the world of translation. Um, I think it's really important to you know, translation is inherently a cross-cultural experience and, and activity. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it, it's wonderful to, to celebrate um, perspectives, uh, many different perspectives, um, you know, coming from, from women, coming from many different languages, coming from writers of color, uh, coming from queer writers. I think these are all um, very important. And, and I think the world of publishing has, and and also the world of education has has left people out. Um, uh, so I think you know building community around Women in Translation Month or and or raising you know um, building community in in terms of you know who you who you connect with in in the world of translation is is really important. Uplifting um, writers and and translators is is really valuable. Um, you know, I think language really impacts how we we see the world. Um, you know, so thinking in terms of of Spanish, for example, they have more verb tenses than English does, and it's just a you know a different perspective. You know, just on a purely linguistic level. You know, and then of course the the value of culture. I think it's just so so important to not um, be stuck in a Eurocentric uh, perspective. Um, 
So, you know, one of the things I've, I've been thinking about a lot is, is access to education. Um, you know, what are, what are ways that people can, you know, how can we support translators who, for example, don't have an opportunity to get an MFA? Um, you know, there are many hindrances to, to education. Um, I, I myself did not, I, I didn't go to my first, I was in my, you know, almost mid thirties by the time I graduated from my first MFA program. Um, and I just graduated in, in May from the translation program in part because I was paying off student loans from undergrad and then paying off student loans from, from my first MFA. So I think, you know, uh, gosh, it's, it's just like such a multi-pronged, um, way in which I think we could be building more support for people, um, giving them better access to studying languages, um, better access to education, also access to libraries and archives. Um, I think the the pandemic has has certainly revealed that it can be very difficult to to access texts um, without uh, being being in a country. And both of you are librarians. I'd love your perspective on you know digitizing archives or or how to make um, materials accessible, particularly you know outside of an academic experience. Since since in you know education will will always be limited unless you go into you know becoming a professor your, yourself um, or becoming a librarian or working for a university um, yeah so I think you know and, and then also in terms of of travel um, even outside of the pandemic I think you know travel to Norway is a very expensive <laughs> enterprise and so um, and yet living in the country that you're translating from is an invaluable experience to get an intimate knowledge of you know the culture and of the language um and so how do we mediate some of these you know barriers and and find ways to to open them up um and yeah to have further representation um in translation and in literature so those are just some of the kind of thoughts i'm I'm mulling over and, and trying to find ways that, you know, I'm a very, I'm definitely an emerging translator, but when I'm more established or, you know, even along the way, I'd love to find ways to um, support, you know, emerging translators and, and you know, giving, sharing my own um, knowledge and, and expertise and, and um, yeah, finding opportunities for that. I agree with many things Kathleen just said. Um, and I think especially what's important is that Kathleen mentioned that there's, um, it's an occasion in the period of time where we open up more access to more, to different representations and people who weren't able to speak, speak out as much as um, they wanted. And at the same time, it's, it's just like thinking about how a pandemic opens up virtual platforms for so many um, academic institutions and so many places in the literary world and not just the literary world, it's just like the whole world in general. And without this virtual platform, like we wouldn't be able to meet each other. I wouldn't be able to meet any of you because we're not in the same city or uh, not, we're not even in the same country. Um, and so I think Women in Translation Month and, and as for so many other different kinds of months like Queer, Queer Translation Month and um, there's a lot of cultural heritage months that um, the literary world celebrates to this day. And that is an occasion to allow more access and more, rep more representation to come over. And also just a month to put everyone's attention to this certain topic or various topics we could talk about um, in terms of the big title and the big umbrella word we have for that month. And at the same time, every every voice is unique and every individual has a voice and we all have different stories to speak out to speak out to and to share with the world so i think having keeping in mind that there's this occasion that also allows us to build community out of that because of the attention we're trying to attract the attract to the audience we're also attract to people who also work from the same community or the same industry I think we've we've touched on a lot of the things that we had in our questions here. So um, I think I'm going to jump a little bit ahead since we are a little limited on time. 
and I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, and talk about maybe how um, how people can, or how the attendees who are here today, how they might be able to raise awareness um, for works in translation um, and advocate for, for more representation. Um, are there some some experience or some some things you guys you two have learned that you could um, share with with the attendees in that respect? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that that. Um, I, I was sort of a little late to, to participating in social media, <laughs> but I also think it's an incredible tool. Um, and I think that it, it can be a really wonderful platform to, you know, to share the works of, of writers, um, you know, uh, of women writers, of, of uh, translation by, by women translators. Um, and you know that that can be a, a very simple and easy thing to do to retweet someone's you know new book coming out um obviously you know purchasing books being a part of the literary community um or going to your your library and saying hey i'd really love to read this this book by this particular um woman author or queer author or writer of color um how can we get this in the library um you know certainly doing things like we're doing today, creating resources lists, um, sharing sharing works, some of our favorite books, advocating for, for writers. Um, these can just be kind of some of the easy ways to, to, to enter into um, to raising more awareness. Also, if you're um, in a position of teaching, teaching women writers, um, teaching writers of color, teaching queer writers, you know, um, expanding your your syllabus and and challenging traditional notions of of what a canon is or or might be, um, and also. Um, you know, writing reviews um, or conducting interviews with with authors can be great ways to, um, you know, give give your time, give to the literary community, and and raise awareness about about new books and new authors. I think another good way to introduce to new readers about works in translation is also um, giving them a sense of urgency. Like when we read news from when we read international news about things happening in different countries, sometimes it's a disaster, sometimes it's, um, it's, it's a different story. And there's always a lot of um, historical background to what's leading up to what happened in those countries, like in Afghanistan and in Myanmar in so many different places. And there's always so much backstory about what leads to the current situation. And that is, and, by knowing that, um, just getting to know the backstory through statistics and everything, sometimes it's really boring to do that. And, and so that's where literature came in, because literature is from the personal experience of living under, living under a dictatorship or living under different circumstances, um, different structure from different countries. And so that's usually how I talked about works in translation with other people, um, either on social media or either just um, translator to translator conversations. And I think just learning about the urgency of different cultures really help people um, get motivated to know more about uh, what's behind it and also what are the literature that talks about um, these issues. <laughs> That's a really great point. And on that note, I want I remembered I wanted to add um, a, a memoir called Dancing in the Mosque, an Afghan woman, mother's letter to her son by Omaira Kaderi. And it's translated by Zaman S. Stanizai. Hopefully I'm pronouncing their name correctly. Um, and Omaira was in the international writing program in, in 2015 and is currently um in in afghanistan so i think yeah it's a really excellent point and i'm paying attention to works that are you know just coming out and how they connect to world events um that are that are urgent and important to be aware of in a broader literary community 
Yeah, those are powerful, powerful reminders that, you know, yeah, it's happening currently. And um, I know that Christy and I, we've had a lot of conversations around our collection development uh, methods and how that ties into, um, you know, trying to to bring in a little bit more diversity into, into um, our library in terms of our collections. So this has been a very, very helpful um, project for us because uh, it's really generated a lot of conversation in terms of how we might and, and what we might want to add and, and to really think about it in a different way than we maybe have before. Um, so I really appreciate these insights because it's, you know, it makes it really um, clear, you know, the sort of a sense of urgency, as you say, Jenna, I think that's really, really well put. Um, Christy, did you have some, some, um, um, I know there are so many questions we had, <laughs> we kind of blew through. Um, uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, um, that we cover. Yeah, I think say. I, yeah, we could talk all day about this. Yeah. So it's just, Anna and I have had been having so much fun just geeking out about all this. So, but um, we do have some questions in the Q and A from our attendees. So we should what? get to those, I think. So, um, um, so should we just take turns on going through them or yeah, that sounds um, great. do we read them out or um, do the panelists want to read? Um, I guess we could just read them out for the yeah, sake of the recording. Exactly. So, I was just going to okay. say that. Yeah. Um, so our first question um, from Julie Moore um, says, thank you for this program. This is very exciting and enlightening to me. We live in a time when there are fewer and fewer foreign language programs in the US. Here in California, there is often only one language, um, for example, Spanish, that is even available to high school students. This is sad to me as I was a foreign language and anthropology major so many years ago. I still believe that it is so important for students to become citizens of the world. There is nothing like taking a language that helps you to learn about a new culture and to learn and care about people from other places around the world. I have read that less than 1% of American adults today are proficient in a foreign language, which I think is pathetic. With this in mind, how do we get students interested in world literature and how do we get more people interested in becoming translators of world literature? So do you, either of you have thoughts, thoughts on that? Any tips maybe? Programs such as this one, who, where we talk about literature and promote promote literature or a translation, I mean. I think there's a lot about traveling to different places and to different cultures physically that attracts a lot of people to learn new languages. When I was back in high school, so many, almost half of my class went to a foreign language class, um, depending what they chose, but they, everyone's choosing a different language to learn. and. I remember the main motivation for us as high school students is because we know that one day we'll be able to get closer to another culture that, um, that was fascinating for us to live in or to just study abroad for a couple of years. And that was the main motivation for us to go traveling. And also we know that by learning another language or several other languages that will facilitate our life in those places. And for me at the time it was um, I wanted to live in France for a while, and so I learned French, and later on I took on, um, I was studying, I was majoring in French um, back in college, and I know that the fluency will help me understand, I would be able to read every single thing when I went to a museum, or I would be able to read the books that might talk about certain places, sometimes it's just talking about a place or talking about a restaurant that you really like. And so I would be able to see everything with my own eyes and not, not needing any translation or like uh, more indirect resources. Sometimes it's being translated, reintroduced by people from different cultures, but that's a different kind of interpretation. And I wanted that fresh eye. And so just that urge that I want to see the culture with my own eyes really bring me to learn um, a, a different language that is not my native tongue. And I think to let students understand this point that there's urgency about the world events and also there's there's this certain there's this fresh perspective perspective they can have of their own um i think understanding both of these will really 
motiv motivate a lot of people to learn new languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are great ideas. Um, yeah, it is it is really a, a concern and, and a challenge. I mean, I think that um, I would really love that if we we lived in a culture where um, you know students were were encouraged and required to take um, languages at a at a much younger age. And I think some schools are probably better at that than than other than others. Um, but the point about language departments at universities being underfunded or defunded or uh, faculty members not being replaced if they retire is is also a, a major concern. Um, you know, ability to to study. Um, uh, you know, for example, indigenous languages, there are only two universities in, in the United States that offer um, language classes in the Sami languages. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a not a lot of, <laughs> a lot of access to, to those languages, all of which are endangered languages. So, um, yeah, I think, again, I, I think, you know, increasing the, the importance of, um, of the ability to understand, you know, um, a, a bit about <laughs> the world and and the importance of that is is so vital. Um, I also think publishers could translate a lot more books of children's literature, uh, or publish children's literature in translation, and and also work to really emphasize the fact that it is a translation, um, you know, including the translator's name on the cover, or um, I don't know, even having interactive <laughs> um, pieces with with the text to to really educate um, children that it's that it's a work of of translation. Um, you know, these things can be really really important. Um, but also, I think that you know, the United States there's a wealth of of, of languages here, um, and there are many heritage speakers, many. Um, young people who are, you know, um, recent children of, of recent immigrants or immigrants themselves. And so I think, um, you know, if language departments or literature departments really recruit them um, and, and seek them out and, and um, you know, seek to involve them in, in programs and, and encourage them to be writers and encourage them to be translators to, to really value those language skills that already exist um, could be another important um, way to, to approach that. Okay, so it looks like um, we've got a couple of questions from Lorelai, so I'm just going to, you know, um, mention both of those at once. She's asking what the most challenging phrase you have had to figure out how to translate is and what made it so challenging. And I think she also said in the chat earlier, um, do you think you have to live in a culture mm -hmm. in order to be able to translate effectively? Um, to answer the, the latest question, I think living abroad and living in a culture definitely helps a um, certain level of cultural understanding. And if not, because not everyone gets the opportunity to travel this long or this far, there's a lot of research and resources in America that can always help us understand the culture better. And I think the main thing, the main thing is how we make use of those resources and how we use those resources and the opportunities we have to understand a different culture. And I think that mostly lies in the attitude and also of how much work we put into this to get to the fluency and to get to the cultural understanding. It's just like reading, reading the world news. Um, we, don't, we, have, we don't necessarily have been to those countries, but we try to understand what happened and we try to understand um, what is the cultural elements that affect all these events happening in different places. And at the same time to answer other questions, I find most the most challenging phrase. I cannot really name a very challenging phrase I've translated because there were so many. And I guess the most challenging phase I've, I've experienced is mostly when I have to translate something that has very specific, um, let's say I've recently translated in Mundo Bad Sultan's short story, it's called El Señor de la Palma. 
And so in that story, there's so many vocabularies about bananas and about banana production. Um, and so there are, there are phrases like um, equipments that transport the bananas to a different place. And so there's like cableways and there's also this um, storage room and also the, the sorting and just like so many verbs about the action of producing and sorting out and processing the bananas. And so just there are so many moments when I translate different short stories, there are specifics about fisherman's life or there's, there's so much nuances that go so deep into a certain in industry's um, landscape that I feel like even in Chinese, which is my native tongue, I wouldn't even know what it's being called. And so that's the most challenging moments I've always been facing um, in various projects because um, I'm not a fisherman and I'm not, I'm, I'm a translator, I'm a writer, and I'm get, getting to know so many aspects of so many industries and cultures. And knowing that if I'm right or wrong, it's, it's really hard to navigate sometimes. Like, I find myself having to do a bunch of research and having to um, consult people who actually work in that industry that if I'm right about this and that. And sometimes there's so much, especially when you're mentioning like a part of a car or, um, or a part of a ship, that, that is just not something we talk about every day. Um, and so those research and those, and just knowing that there's, um, there's so many details that you, you need to get to, even though you're not the professional in that industry, it's, re it's really challenging as a translator. Um, I, I'm like, so my curiosity is so piqued about your knowledge now about bananas. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I think in terms of challenging phrases or um, challenging aspects of, of language. Um, I, an exercise that our professors would have us do at Iowa very early on was to really write up um, a list or kind of a mini essay about the characteristics uh, of the language that you're translating from. And this can be a really useful tool to just kind of have them all <laughs> on a page or, or as many as you can come up with. And then of course you can always add to your list as you're, as you're moving forward. But thinking, for example, in, from Norwegian, um, you know, of course, in English, we have compound nouns, um, um, but in, in Norwegian, they're, they're so much more prevalent. And I think in Norwegian poetry, there's certainly, uh, you know, an invitation to like invent and to play with um, compound nouns. And, and so translating words that, you know, an author has, for example, completely invented can be sort of a, a challenge, you know, um, I can, I can be kind of scrambling through a dictionary and thinking like, does this word exist <laughs> or have they created it? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, those, those kinds of rabbit holes can be really, really fascinating. And, and also thinking in terms of like etymology of, of words and etymology of, of phrases uh, can really, you know, um, be informative for, for choices and decisions that you make. Um, Another challenge between Norwegian and English is that usually translations um, between Norwegian to, to English um, result in a like higher word count. <laughs> and so the poems that I have been translating have been these, you know, brief like four to five line poems where every word has to count. And so thinking in terms of you know, um, articles when definite articles are critical and and when they're like just making the the rhythm or um, the lyricism or the musicality of the English language clunky and um, so thinking about some of those kinds of of characteristics and um, challenges can be a lot of fun um, certainly and um, to the other part of the question in terms of living in the country I think. I think it can really be a valuable um, experience, and I would I would recommend people find ways to you know seek out um, funding as much as possible. It, you know, if there are scholarships to study abroad, um, 
even for temporary periods of time, like a summer or, uh, you know, search for fellowships or um, even doing volunteer work um, or um, teaching, you know, seeking out some of those opportunities to kind of support your your work um, can be really helpful because there, there can certainly be financial, um, uh, you know, uh, difficulties in, in terms of living uh, abroad, uh, particularly depending on on where you're coming from and where you're going to. Thank you so much for that. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> we have three minutes. Um, so, um, and I see that we still have some questions here. Um, Christy, what do you think? Should we maybe copy those so that we can address those later? Because I think that we probably won't be able to get to all of those. I think so. Yeah, they look like some interesting questions. Yes. So maybe we can send those out um, and and have a further conversation. Um, so we're, we apologize that we, we ran out of time. <laughs> so, um, but we wanted to just um, take a few minutes to wrap up and talk about some upcoming events. Um, Yes, I'd Go like ahead, to thank Anna. all of you, you know, for, uh, we'd like to thank both our panelists for, for uh, uh, spending this time with us and, and sharing these insights. It's really been a pleasure. We're so grateful that you were able to participate and we're really pleased that uh, uh, the attendees um, were so engaged and had so many interesting questions and I wish we had a lot more time. Um, so Christy um, is going to share some upcoming events as well. Yeah, so in the document that I sent out, um, there, um, the upcoming events are also there. Um, but we just wanted to point out that um, Jenna will be teaching a few um, online workshops um, through Catapult, uh, which is an, an online um, uh, platform. Um, on There's a two-week online translation workshop on translating violence and trauma. And then she'll also be teaching another one on navigating the publishing world as a BIPOC woman, queer, non-binary translator. So they both sound fascinating. And there are other um, workshops available on the Catapult site as well. So if you're interested, definitely check those out. Also, um, the American Literary Translators um, Association conference is coming up and it's gonna be a hybrid conference. So part of it will be online and part will be in person. Um, and so that's coming up in um, October and November. And I, I put the link in there as well. Um, I attended it for the first time online uh, last year and it was, it was fantastic. It was just, there was so many good things. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, and then um, in terms of Anna and I, we will be uh, doing another workshop uh, tentatively. We're, we're hoping to do one um, in December um, on Nordic literature. Um, and Anna, do you just want to give a little plug about why December is kind of an important month um, in Iceland for book publishing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, in Iceland, we have Yola Bok Flodith, which is a... Um, a big uh, publishing um, endeavor that takes place right before Christmas and they send out a catalog to all residents of Iceland so that they can select books and people buy lots of books and share um, with each other. So um, they, this is the biggest sort of present at Christmas that uh, people give. Um, so uh, that's kind of the idea behind you know, the timing for us. Thank you, Anna. Um, so yeah, so stay tuned for more information about that. Um, as I said, we, we haven't set a date yet, but that's our, our next um, planned event. Um, and we're also hoping to do other events um, centered around uh, global literature, translation, um, culture. Um, so stay tuned for those. And I just want to thank you all again for coming and thank you again to our panelists. Um, we've had such great conversations and um, I'm looking forward actually to doing this again. Um, if you are on social media and you are reading um, uh, Women in Translation, be sure to um, put the hashtag uh, WIT month um, for Women in Translation month um, to help kind of spread the word about what you're reading. And I think that's all that I have. So anything else you want to add, Anna? That's it. I thank you all so much. And we will make sure to get those, those uh, three last questions to the panelists and, um, and share their responses with you. Mm -hmm.
So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.